morning. We are so glad to be with you on this very special Sunday. Memorial Day should be extra special for those of us who know the Lord, because if it hadn't been for those that wore the uniform and went into harm's way and gave their lives, we might not have the freedoms that we have today. And many of them went into battle knowing that they wouldn't be coming home. Well, there was a day when God sent his son, Jesus, into the world and said, you will go into the world and, and you will be hated and you will be despised and rejected and ultimately nailed to the cross. But because of that, we have a new kind of freedom. We are free in Christ from the power and the presence. And one day, sin will be no more because of what Jesus has done on the cross. So we are very happy to be with you today. We are going to be looking at the subject of spiritual maturity. I really believe that there are a lot of people that feel that if they do some things and don't do other things, they are spiritually mature. Well, not quite. And we will be talking about some of the evidences of spiritual maturity. How do you know whether you are making progress spiritually? I met a person who told me several times, he said, well, I don't know much about God, don't know much about the Bible. I do know this, I'm saved, not going to hell. And I said, you know, brother, there's so much more than just not going to hell when you die. There's, there's so much more for you to experience. When you trusted Jesus Christ as Savior, you began a spiritual journey. And this spiritual journey changed your destination. And I would like to talk today about that destination that God has given to us. Think for a moment in terms of taking a road trip, let's say from Detroit to, well, let's say California. We've been on a lot of road trips over the last 50 years, Nancy and I have. And we visited all 50 states. How many have visited all 50 states? Boy, you folks need to travel this summer. <laughs> but we have visited all 50 states and we are going around again. <coughs> the second time. Now we've got 40 more states to go. And I don't know if I have enough years left. But let's just consider for a moment that we're taking a road trip to California. And as you take that road trip, you know that you will be expected to pass certain cities. Now, you will leave Detroit, and you may come to Lansing. You may come to Kalamazoo. And then maybe the outskirts of Chicago on Interstate 80. And you'll keep on going west, and you'll maybe come to the Quad Cities, and after that, Des Moines. And then when you leave Des Moines, uh, uh, a lot of cow pasture on the way to Omaha, Nebraska. And then after that, you'll finally see the terrain change. You'll see the hills and the distant mountains, and you'll finally come to Denver. And you will know that you are on the right path because you will be passing certain milestones along the way. Now, what, what would happen if you would see a sign that says, you know, when we are making trips every once in a while, Nancy will say, where are we? And I will say, I haven't a clue. And sometimes, you know, you just drive and you drive and drive. You don't pay much attention. You just keep driving. She says, where are we? And imagine you're making this trip, this road trip to California, and you will find a sign that says, welcome to Jacksonville, Florida. You would immediately know 
you will immediately know that you've somehow gotten off track, that you're not making progress on your journey. And let's apply this to your spiritual journey. You can gauge your progress. You can gauge your progress. And there are certain what we might call milestones in scripture that will help us understand if we are really making progress or if we're just kind of spinning wheels and going no place or, or have gotten distracted. Now, I have, a, I have a list for you, should be easy to follow. There's no such thing as a perfect list. You may add some things to it, that's fine. Uh, may, you may want to take some things off of it, that's fine. But I would like to share with you today and next, next week some things that you should, you should look for that will help gauge you and guide you in knowing whether you are on the right track or whether you are just making no progress at all. Our scripture reading today is from the book of Colossians chapter 2. Colossians, the second chapter. And I'm going to be reading from verse 6 through 10 and then we will pray. But there are certain words here that I would like you to look at. Certain words that I would like you to look at as we turn there. Colossians chapter 2 for our script reading beginning with verse 6. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Now notice some of these words, walk, rooted, built up, established, abounding with thanksgiving. And then it says, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and notice, you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. Now just one more verse in 2 Peter chapter 3. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to whom be glory both now and forever. Let's pray. Father, guide us in your word today. Your word is truth. And all that we need to know about you is found in the pages of scripture. Thank you for revealing yourself so plainly and clearly. Guide us now as we open up your word and as help us to learn some things as possible. Father, there's somebody here that's just kind of floating. They're not really making any progress. Maybe something they will hear today will guide them in their spiritual growth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now I would like to share with you today several things that, that I believe are imperative in our Christian walk. And they are things that logically should, they, they should accompany the mature Christian, the growing Christian that is prospering, as opposed to the one that is just kind of floating, no progress at all. Number one, a mature Christian should have assurance and confidence in his salvation. And so I ask this question today, do you go to bed at night and lay your head in your pillow with assurance and confidence that you are his and he is yours? 
2 Timothy 1, 12, I know whom I have believed. I, I, I like that. I really like that. That was one of the first verses I grasped onto when I became a believer. I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed to him unto that day. I read that and I said, I'm going to claim that for my own. I know the Apostle Paul claimed that. I'm going to claim that. And from the time that I got saved, God gave me that overwhelming assurance that I was his. Now, when we have assurance of salvation, we will not be vacillating. We will not have spells of doubt. We, you know, James talked about those that are tossed about like a boat is in the rough seas. But we will have assurance and enough so that we will be able to explain it to others. When you have assurance, you will be able to open up your Bible and share it and share others the hope that you have within you. And so number one, a mature Christian, a growing Christian, will have assurance of salvation. Number two, a, a mature Christian will have confidence in God's sovereignty. Ephesians 1.9, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to the good pleasure which he purposed in himself. Boy, isn't today a, a, a day in which we could be consumed in world events? Yeah, I, I used to enjoy watching the news, but boy, I tell you, the news is hard to watch anymore, isn't it? Now, I, uh, I grew up in a family where we read newspapers and watched the news, but boy, today is really depressing. And we look around, we say, man, everybody is nuts today. Except, except you and me, and I'm not sure about you, you know. <laughs> but, but everybody, it seems like, is this off the rocker? As my mother used to say. Well, a growing Christian will, will have confidence that God is sovereign, God is in charge. Now, we know that Satan is the prince of this air, but God has placed limits on his activity, and when it's all said and done, we know that God will prevail, amen? He is sovereign and he will prevail. And we don't always understand how God works. You know, God doesn't, God doesn't always make sense from our perspective. I mean, we see things that go on and we, and we, and we don't, we have a hard time equating that to a sovereign God. Well, notice having made known to us the mystery of his will, the mystery of his will. When a person has confidence in the sovereignty of God, he will never question God when things go badly. Things don't always go well for us as Christians. And the reason why we question God when things don't go well is because we are questioning his sovereignty. God is good and he is good all the time and we don't always understand the mystery of his will, but we know that God is still in charge. And when things seem to be falling apart in our world, in our country and in our uh, maybe you have a family that's struggling right now and you, you wonder what in the world is happening. Remember, God is sovereign. And there have been times when I have prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and I came to the conclusion God just isn't hearing, God just isn't listening. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, I was reminded of something. Oh, God's listening, but God is also sovereign. God is also sovereign. And so, number one, when, when, we, when we are growing as a Christian, we will have assurance of our salvation. Number two, we will have confidence 
in God's sovereignty, no matter what is going on in your life or your family or your country, God is still on the throne and he will prevail. And he is working all things out according to the pleasure of his good will. And it is a matter of not God conforming to my will, but it's a matter of me conforming to God's will. Number three, a growing Christian will have a firm grasp of biblical truth, or you will at least be making progress in discovering biblical truth on your own. Ephesians 4.14, we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. And you know, every, every year there are hundreds of brand new churches, organized churches, every year, and people are flocking to them. And as I drive around town where I live in Flint, Michigan, I, 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 I was driving yesterday and I saw a brand new church just open up. Sunshine, Bible church, something like that, I don't know. But everywhere you look, there's new isms and new cults and new churches and new beliefs. A growing Christian will be developing a grasp of biblical truth. Now, we're talking about convictions. We're not talking about just going along with what your church believes. Now, you have a covenant, you have a constitution, you have a, a belief structure here like most churches do. But it will go deeper than that. You will develop convictions on your own. It will go beyond what your parents taught you. It'll go beyond what your parents believed. It'll go beyond what your friends believe. You will be developing convictions based upon the word of God. You will be able to search the scriptures and discover truth on your own. I remember very plainly the day when I opened up the Bible. I was just a baby Christian. I got saved about 17 years old. And, and, I, and for the first time, I opened up the Word of God and I read a verse and I understood it and was able to apply it to my life. Boy, that, was that life changing. I said, I can do this. I can learn. I can discover truth. And a growing Christian will come to the place where he's able to be energized by the study of God's word. He will go beyond what he learns in church. Now, what you learn in church is important. And what you learn in your classes is important. But we must come to the place where we are able on our very own to open up the word of God and find God reveal truth to me personally. And the very first time that happens, it'll be life changing and you'll say, I want more. <laughs> I want more of what he has to say. And that defines what the mature Christian is like. Number four, a Christ-centered and directed esteem. Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. For in Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him. Years ago, I read the book titled Christ Esteem. I recommend it if you had a problem with your esteem. A Christ-directed esteem means that we will no longer seek to find the approval of our friends, our neighbors, our working companions. I won't have to get my significance by what people think about me. I won't have to get my, I won't have to rest my self-worth on, on what people around me think. And especially when you're young and in school and you're impressionable and you wanna fit into the crowd at school, you, you really must come, get, because people can be cruel and you must come to the place where your esteem rests and your significance rests on Jesus Christ. For in Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead. And I love this, you are complete in him. And you know, 
Our culture is built on trying to find approval and love of, love of others. I'm, I, I was from Minnesota and lived near the Mall of America, got about 500 stores there. And I love to walk through the Mall of America, all three stores, I guess there's four stores now. And, and I used to just love walking down there. And, and, and when I, it took me about an hour and a half when I got all done, I said, you know, you, you couldn't buy a screwdriver in this whole place. And that's true. Here are the, the four or five hundred stores and you can't even buy a hammer. What good is it? And, and, and then you look around. And, 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 and you see, almost all of the stores are built on trying to enhance your self in the, in, in the eyes of others to make you look more beautiful, to make you look more accepted, to make you look more worthy. So a mature Christian will find their self-esteem, not from our culture, but find our esteem based upon the fact that if only God loves me, I am significant. Are you able to say that right now? If in this whole world, if there's only one person that loves me, and that's God, I can be significant. Well, I have news for you. God does love you. And you can place your total significance and your total worth and your total value on the fact that you have a God that if you were the only one that would ever have said yes to salvation, he would have sent his son to die for you because he loved you just that much. Number five. A growing Christian will strive to possess a godly testimony, 1 Peter 2, 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you. Apostle Paul says you're an example of the believer in word and deed. And a growing Christian should, uh, should have a desire to have a godly testimony. An example of what the believer is. God has sent us on a mission. And the mission is to reach as many people as we can with the gospel of Christ. But you know, we can't lead others to follow Christ if we are following the world. Can I say that again? We really can't lead others to follow Christ when we the believers are following the world. And so a growing Christian, well, be in the process of developing a testimony that is, that, you know, we're the light of the world. Number six. A growing Christian understands and applies New Testament grace. I, I would suggest that, that you ask one of your pastors to recommend a good book on the subject of grace. I won't recommend one. I would rather have your pastors do that. Have them recommend a good book. You know, the Bible says in 2 Peter 3.18, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I, I discovered what grace was late in life. It's not something that I, I, I started to understand. When I got saved, there was undeserved mercy. And some people, that's all grace is. And you really must grow in grace so that as you grow as a believer, you understand how to apply grace more and more fully. Grace is, it, it, it means that God loves us with an unconditional love. There's nothing that we can do to make God love us more. There's nothing that we can do to make God love us less. That God loves us unconditionally and he always will. Now some people say, well, that means I can flirt with the world, that means I can skip church, that means I don't have to give as much money, that means I, I 
a, a little sin is okay. And, 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 and they say, well, like the Apostle Paul says, don't sin that grace may abound. Isn't that what Paul said? He, don't, don't, don't sin that grace may abound. And so, the, in other words, when we grow in grace, we will come to the understanding. We will come to the understanding that grace is not an excuse to be careless morally or spiritually, but grace is a motivator to obey and serve him more fully. And when we, when we understand grace, we will realize it, it, it is a motivator to be more holy, not an excuse to be less holy. I grew up in a Wesleyan background, and when my grandparents realized that I was going into the ministry to be a Baptist, they went into depression. They felt that Baptist meant that if we believe in grace, that means that we can sin with impunity. That's not what we believe at all. Grace, when we grow in grace, we will understand that it is a motivator to obey and serve him more and more fully. Number seven. When we grow as a Christian, we will be become increasingly dependent on Christ. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless... You you abide in me. You know, there is a battle that we all face. It's a battle between self-will and God's divine direction. We all face that battle. And we probably always will. It's the, the, the Apostle Paul talked about this in Romans 7. The flesh and the spirit, they're always fighting each other. But the believer will become more and more dependent on Christ. When you come to the place when every morning you will awaken and you will say, Dear God, I will totally fail unless you intervene in my life. There was a time in my ministry when I, things are going smoothly and I was pretty confident and uh, everything was going so smoothly. And, and then I got sick and I had to take a couple of months off and I felt, you know, I, I don't know if I'll ever be able to be involved in ministry again. Well, when I got better, I came and my life was changed in this respect. Every, every morning, every Sunday morning, I woke up and I said the same thing. I said, dear God, I have a week to prepare three messages. I have a week to serve you and counsel. I have a week to visit people in the hospital and I have a week to do all this and I will fail miserably unless you miraculously intervene in my life. And unless the Holy Spirit endows me with understanding, I will totally fail. Now you must come to the place if you are so confident that you can wing your Sunday school lesson as a teacher, you're not growing because your confidence is in you. If you think that you've had enough training and you're smart enough, if you come to that place, you're not trusting in God. He is the vine, we are the branches and we can't allow ourselves to be separated. So the growing Christian will become increasingly dependent on Christ. Number eight. The growing Christian will become increasingly heavenly minded for our citizenship is in heaven. Where's your home? Well, I live in Burton, Michigan, a suburb of Flint. That's my home. Well, it's where I stay, but that's not my home. I remember singing when I got saved uh, a chorus this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. Remember that song? Remember that song? And, and, and I went to this youth group, and that's what they sang. 
This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. A growing Christian will have an increasingly heavenly minded and be eager to be with Christ. Abraham was on a journey out of the earth of the Chaldees and God sent him on a journey. God said, I'll tell you where to go. And in Hebrews 11, the Bible says, you know, Abraham was on a journey, but he looked for a city whose founder or maker was God. He looked far beyond Jerusalem, the Holy Land. Abraham was on this journey and he was looking for Israel, the land of Israel, but, but he, he looked far beyond to the city whose founder or maker is God. I tell my doctor, I said, Doc, you, you try too hard to keep me out of heaven. And he stares at me. He is a believer. But I said, you try so hard. You do all these things and you, wait, you, you want me to last forever? No, I'm not going to make this second round of states. You know, I'm not gonna, I don't expect to be around 50 years but you try so hard to keep me out of heaven. That's my home. That's where I belong. And when your heart stops and you stand at the gates of heaven, you'll see the arms of Jesus Christ saying, welcome home. There's a song that says, welcome home children. Remember that song? Welcome home children. And that's the first words we'll hear. Welcome home. You've been going all over the world, but welcome, welcome home. Well, there's one more, and that's number nine. And that begins next week. That begins next week. Number nine is understand what it means to live by faith. Oh, one of the imperatives and for Christians is learning to live by faith. Why? Because this is about four or five verses in the Bible that tell us to live by faith. And so we begin next week and we will be talking about how do we live by faith in a world that promises us everything. And I have some homework for you, okay? I want you to go home and I want you to go to your pantry, to all your cupboards in your kitchen, all through your house and find out how many days that you can live. I don't mean enjoy, but how many days that you can live on the food that you have in your home. Think about it. Think about it. And then ask this question, am I fulfilling what God has told me to live by faith. So how do we live for Christ? How do we live by faith day by day in a world that promises to give us everything that we need? That's next week. But in closing, I ask you this. Maybe you're here and you haven't started your journey yet. Maybe you haven't even left Detroit yet. And, and Los Angeles is a way you go from city to city, step by step. And these things that we've talked about, they're principles that step by step by step. We don't learn them all at once. We don't discover them all at once. But we grow slowly in understanding them. But maybe you're here, you haven't started the journey yet. You can't make it on your own. Jesus died on the cross who paid the price of your sin. And he says, if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. How do you know faith is genuine? Faith can be kind of obscure, can't it? It can be kind of a, a, a difficult thing to understand. How do you know if your faith is genuine? Paul told us, if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, maybe there's somebody here today who maybe you are a believer, but you've never, ever told somebody 
that you and all Christ is your Savior. Paul says, if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe. If you're a believer here today and you've never told anybody, will you go to them and say, I want you to know that I know Jesus Christ as my Savior. And the Apostle Paul would say, it is that that affirms that our faith is real. Father, we thank you for these dear people. We thank you for each one of them, and we know that they are each one on a spiritual journey. Some are making better progress than others. Some are just getting started. There may be some here that are brand new in the faith, and they're just getting started. Encourage them, I pray. For those that have been saved for many years, I pray they would not be discouraged. I pray that they would that that they would keep going and they would keep making progress and they would continue their spiritual journey knowing that at the end we will spend eternity together so we love you we thank you for this special day we can celebrate and remember those that have gone before us but we're most of all thankful for jesus christ who paid the price of our sin So we pray your blessing now as we are dismissed in Jesus' name.